What do you think about when you hear the name the de Havilland Comet? I am willing to bet that most of you think about a string of horrible mid-air breakups that happened back in the 1950s due to its construction with two large square windows on the aircraft, right? Well, what if I told you that those accidents actually weren't caused by those square windows at all because the comet didn't have square windows, as you can clearly see here. There is so much more to tell in the story of this beautiful trailblazing aircraft, so that's what I'm going to do in today's video. Stay tuned. So today I'm going to start a new series where we will look back at the true aviation classic. Iconic airliners that really left their mark in aviation and make the hair stand up on the arms of every aviation enthusiast out there. Now, not all of these aircraft are going to be jets or even civilian, but we will get things going with a look at the de Havilland Comet, a design unfortunately best known for all of the wrong reasons. So, a company that is first to come up with something completely new is often referred to as a first mover. They can obviously get an enormous advantage over their competitors if the design feature they come up with is successful, pulling ahead while all others try to catch up. But often, being first also means that you will have to solve all of the new problems that comes with radical new concepts. That always costs a lot of money, but that's normally okay since the investment should lead to a substantial payout at some point, right? Well, unfortunately for this to work, you will have to make sure that you can find all of the major new problems during the actual development. There is no guarantee that you will, and if you get things wrong, well, then sorting this out can become a really costly and time-consuming endeavor, and the competition might actually be able to catch up to you and leave you behind. There are several modern examples of this. MySpace come to mind, for example. But the story of the de Havilland Comet is probably the best or worst example of this principle. Now, this is not going to be an accident investigation episode. I'll save that for the Mentor Pilot channel and I might actually do a specific video on it. But of course, I will have to explain the issues that this aircraft had, which include but are not limited to its pressurization of the passenger cabin. But before we get there, we will have to have a look at the history of this lovely aircraft, starting with the time in which it was created, which, if anything, just makes it even more amazing. The time immediately following World War II was not easy for almost anyone, and that was certainly also true for Great Britain and its people. But incredibly, the development of the Comet had actually begun during the Second World War and was in full swing as the war ended. British authorities had started contemplating the specifications of a transatlantic passenger aircraft as early as 1943, except, of course, that they weren't thinking about using jet engines on those aircraft at the time. Early jet engines were real fuel guzzlers, and making a jetliner with enough range to cross the Atlantic was actually believed to be impossible back then. But Sir Geoffrey de Havilland did not agree with that premise at all. During the war, the de Havilland Aircraft Company had designed and built a jet fighter, the de Havilland Vampire, who first flew back in 1943. His company was also involved in engine design, so Sir Geoffrey likely understood the future potential of the jet engines. He actually believed that these new jet engines would become necessary in future transatlantic airliners if they were going to make full advantage of other wartime advances in aircraft design, like swept wings, for example. This new wing design allowed much higher cruise speeds at higher altitudes, but they also came with their own aerodynamic problems that would soon become apparent. The other innovation that had come out of the war was pressurized cabins, which will feature prominently in the story of the Comet. But contrary to what most people think, the Comet was far from the first airliner to use cabin pressurization. The inability of the human body to absorb enough oxygen at higher altitude was well known since before even the First World War, so scientists and engineers had been working hard trying to solve this issue for decades, already at the time when the comet was conceived. But why, you might ask, do we actually have to fly that high? Well, the higher we climb, the thinner the air gets, which, very simply put, means that the aircraft has to deal with less drag. And this means that the higher we can fly safely, the higher our speed will be, meaning that we can go further with the same amount of fuel. 
Plus, of course, in wartime, flying higher made it much harder for people on the ground to shoot at you, which understandably was a quite strong and good incentive for military flight crews. So, for both of these reasons, a lot of research was done before and during the Second World War on how to get enough oxygen into people's bodies to keep them alive and functioning at high altitudes. In the war, crews often relied on oxygen masks, but this meant that they would still have to deal with the sometimes extreme cold at those higher altitudes. Temperatures can easily drop down to below minus 50 degrees Celsius up there, so some designers were also experimenting with the use of pressure suits, which looked pretty horrendous to wear, to be honest. So eventually, designers instead concentrated on trying to pressurize the entire aircraft cabin, which was actually also an idea that had appeared before the Second World War. The reason that the designers preferred this way of dealing with the problem was because pressurization would be something that passenger aircraft could also benefit from. In fact, the first commercial airliner to feature cabin pressurization was the Boeing 307 Stratoliner, which was based on the unpressurized B-17. Actually, the Stratoliner entered service in 1940, that's even before the United States entered the war, and it came even before Boeing's B-29 bomber, which was often thought to be the first aircraft with a pressurized cabin. However, it would actually take quite a bit longer for the idea to properly catch on. Only 10 Boeing Stratoliners were actually built before the wartime priorities shifted away from them. But soon, more pressurized aircraft would follow, like the beautiful Lockheed Constellation, which is another classic, and soon after the war, the Douglas DC-6 and the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. All of these aircraft flew and entered service in the 1940s, before the jet-powered Comet did, so you might wonder if these and other aircraft already had pressurization, then why didn't they have the same problems as the Comet eventually did? After all, some, like the Boeing Stratoliner for example, definitely had those square windows. Well, I'll explain all of that after this. About two months ago, I decided to take my beautiful wife Sandra for a second honeymoon, and we decided to go to Thailand, which is a country that we both really love. I actually made a vlog about it, you can check it out later. Once we were there though, chilling in the hotel room one evening, I remember this classic Swedish TV series called 30 Degrees in February, which is about a bunch of lonely Swedes moving to Thailand in pursuit of happiness. It's both sad and really wonderful at the same time, and I just really wanted to watch it because we were actually there. But when I signed into SVT Play, it was of course geo-restricted to Sweden only, and this happens all the time when I'm out traveling nowadays. So, I downloaded NordVPN, today's sponsor to Sandra's iPad, logged in, clicked on Sweden, and voila, we could start watching it immediately. I actually use NordVPN this way a lot when I'm out traveling nowadays, both to see my normal content, but also to find better prices on tickets and hotels. You should try it out, you'll be amazed of the differences that you can find. Obviously, it's also a super fast VPN and it offers loads of safety features, but my point here is that I really do use this service and that's why I have agreed to promote them. So, if you want to try out Nord, then use the link here below, which is nordvpn.com slash mentornow to get four extra months for free when you sign a two-year deal. It's a time-limited offer, so click it fast. Thank you, Nord. Now, back to the story. Even though the De Havilland Comet wasn't the first airliner to use cabin pressurization, it really took pressurization to a whole new level, literally. Boeing's Stratoliner, the first pressurized airliner, cruised at an altitude between 15 and 20,000 feet. The Lockheed Constellation, which was the first pressurized airliner to actually see widespread use, they pushed things a bit more, to 24,000 feet, and the following DC-6 managed only another 1,000 feet higher than that. Then followed the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, who fared a bit better, with a service ceiling of 32,000 feet. That was reasonably high, but by comparison, the de Havilland designed the Comet to have a max cruise altitude of 42,000 feet, a full 10,000 feet higher than the Stratocruiser did. Just to put that into perspective, that's a thousand feet higher than the maximum cruise altitude for the Boeing 737 that I fly today. This 10,000 feet difference might not sound like much, it was the same difference as between the Stratoliner and the Stratocruiser, but atmospheric pressure doesn't simply drop in a linear fashion. 
air density at 42,000 feet is substantially lower than at 32,000. And with that comes a much higher pressure differential between the pressure inside the cabin and outside. You can think of it like a balloon which is getting filled by more and more air. The reason the comet needed to reach that high was to maximize the potential of its new jet engines. The first version, known as Comet 1, had four Ghost 50 Mark I engines that de Havilland themselves built in their engine division. But later versions would instead use the Royce Royce Avon engines, and the placement of those engines set the Comet apart from almost anything else out there. Airliners today typically have their engines inside pods, either hanging from pylons under the wing or mounted in the rear of the fuselage. And funny enough, this podded layout actually came before the Comet did. Large jets like the B-47 Stratojet bomber first flew with engines mounted in pylons already back in 1947. In theory, that podded design would produce more drag, and to avoid this, the de Havilland engineers decided to instead bury the engines inside of the wings. Now, this looks great, and it also actually comes with some very practical advantages. For example, with all four engines close to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft, the Comet didn't need a huge vertical stabilizer and rudder to handle asymmetric thrust in case of an engine failure. And that smaller fin also meant a little bit less drag. And despite this new integrated placement of the engines, access to them from the ground was reportedly satisfactory, and their positions far above the ground meant that they were much less prone to suck in debris from the ground below and get damaged. But of course, this position also had some serious drawbacks. There is a reason why we don't see engines mounted this way today. Because mounting the engines in pairs this close to each other meant that they needed to have some very heavy shielding to keep one engine safe if the other would suffer an uncontained failure or a fire, for example. And that wasn't the only thing that added weight to this design. The wing structure also needed to be substantially heavier than that on more conventional wings. And that's because wings generally rely on one or two wing spars, which are basically beams that run the length of the wing left to right. But if you need to put two engines through these spars, right where they meet the fuselage, well, then you have to beef them up a lot. Plus, if in later years you need to upgrade the aircraft with bigger engines, which the Havilland actually had to do, well, then you had to re-engineer the whole wing structure once again. And that's not the only little design quirk that the Comet had, which would make today's designers just shake their heads. For example, the doors to the baggage hold were located in the floor under the aircrafts. This meant that the baggage handlers had to manually load and unload each piece of luggage vertically, which was incredibly slow. And as a former baggage handler myself, I am really happy that that design feature didn't catch on. But in most ways, the Comet was just as revolutionary as it looked. This was, for example, the first commercial aircraft with boogie landing gears, an idea so new that the prototypes of the aircraft, who first flew back in July 1949, were still using conventional tricycle gear with one wheel on each gear leg, but this was then upgraded to the boogie design on coming models. The design of the aircraft was actually so ahead of its time that it quickly found some imitators. If you take a look at the Sud Aviation Caravelle, for example, you can clearly see that the noses of the two aircraft are nearly identical. And that's because Sud Aviation actually licensed the cockpit along with the rest of the front section plus the landing gear from the Comet. The wing also had a similar overall design but without the engines in the roots because those were tail mounted on the Caravelle. But another innovation that the Comet introduced, which was a huge deal, was the use of powered flight controls. This allowed the pilots to overcome aerodynamic forces on the control surfaces and it was completely necessary on this aircraft, both because of the size of it and because it also had much higher cruise speeds. In other ways, the Comet was similar to other airliners at the time, using a four cockpit crew with two pilots, one navigator and one flight engineer, but there were so many new systems in the Comet that certifying it with the aviation authorities at the time became a huge challenge. But of course, the greatest innovation of the Comet was the fact that it was a jet aircraft. 
By today's standards, those early turbojet engines were incredibly noisy, but at the time that the Comet was introduced, those engines were still considered reasonably quiet compared to the incredibly loud and vibrating piston engines that other airliners were using. So what was it that actually went wrong with this aircraft then that gave it such a notorious reputation? Well, the first problem that was identified was those powered flight controls, which did what they were designed to do, but they didn't give much feedback to the pilots. This actually contributed to some early accidents, where the pilots simply over-controlled the aircraft without noticing it causing the airframe to be overstressed. The solution was to add an artificial feel system to the controls, which is a system that designers of the aircraft would later copy and it is in principle the same thing as is being used today. Another issue was the aerofoil or shape of the wing. The Comet had a wing with a swept leading edge, which helped it achieve its high cruise speed, but at low speeds, engineers later found that the wing could abruptly stall at high angles of attack. This characteristic also contributed to those early accidents involving loss of control during takeoff, possibly in combination with some bad weather and also the previously mentioned over-controlling from the pilots. De Havilland modified the profile of the wing's leading edge and added wing fences, which solved this problem by stopping the air from flowing spanwise and therefore stopped the wing from stalling all at once, causing a more gentle stall onset. But of course, the issue that really stigmatized the Comet was metal fatigue. Now, we might dive deeper into this issue in a Mentor Pilot episode, but in essence, metal fatigue is the creation and propagation of cracks because of repetitive wear or cycles like the pressurization and depressurization of an aircraft. When the Comet first flew, we just didn't have the understanding of metal fatigue that we do today. For example, today we know that not all aluminium alloys can handle pressurization cycles equally and this means that some alloys are more prone to metal fatigue than others. Now, sharp inside corners in metal structures are another place where fatigue cracks can appear after repeated cycles and this is where we get to the matter of the windows. But what windows? Since the Comet never really had square windows, why has this idea stuck with so many people? Well, the answer to this, in part, is probably because de Havilland did make the windows of later versions of the Comet rounded, leading to people assuming that this was a design change in reaction to the crashes. But likely the main reason for this misunderstanding is that the investigation into the explosive decompressions of the Comet 1 models identified the cutouts for the ADF antennas on the aircraft's roof as the real culprit. And in the report, these openings, which had a surrounding structure with many tight inside corners, were called ADF aerial windows. And that's where the misunderstanding in the press likely started. Now, cracks did indeed go through the passenger windows, including during testing, but the passenger windows were not the original source of these cracks. By the way, have a look at this photo. This is the Boeing prototype that eventually led to the 707 among other aircraft and note the shape of its passenger windows. Now, even if the shape of the Comet's windows wasn't what caused its downfall, its impact on the industry was immediate and we see it still up until today. But the fact is that when the Boeing 707 eventually entered service, its windows were much bigger and actually had less rounded corners than the Comet did. So that should settle the debate about the window shapes being the culprit once and for all. Instead, there was another source of cracks in the Comet, which came from the rivet holes in the aircraft skin. These holes were punched in a way that could leave tiny cracks when they were made that could start propagating further. And in addition to this, the aluminium skins were too thin and of an alloy prone to metal fatigue. Worse still, the rest of the aircraft structure wasn't strong enough to actually hold the plane together when the skin tore open due to the fatigue cracks. Uncovering the true cause of these failures took a lot of time and as the investigation was happening, all of the de Havilland Comets were grounded. Once the full scope of the design flaws were found, the changes needed to return the aircraft to service were so extreme that many of the aircraft were just retired instead. The remaining Comets who actually were rectified were mostly passed on to the military or used for research or other roles. 
Now, the Haviland did eventually develop a version of the aircraft that incorporated all of the required fixes, including many other improvements like longer fuselage and better engines, and this new aircraft was called the Comet 4. But it came too late. The Comet 4 was delivered to the British Overseas Airways Corporation, the precursor of British Airways, in late September 1954. But then the Boeing 707 entered service about a month later, and the rest, as they say, is history. In total, the Havilland made just 114 Comets, including all types and variants, and in contrast, Boeing made over a thousand commercial 707s and over 800 military KC-135s and other variants of it. Even the Douglas DC-8, which flew a year after the 707, delivered around 550 aircraft, making the Comet a monumental commercial fiasco. But to be fair here, and kind of even out the numbers a bit, 51 Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft would eventually also be made. These planes have strong lineage connection directly to the Comet. The first two Nimrods were prototypes that used Comet fuselages, but Nimrods had turbofan engines and many other modifications, including a completely re-engineered cockpit and other systems. The RAF only retired the last of the Nimrods in 2011 after many updates, which shows that the design really had more potential than it is often given credit for. But without a question, the biggest debt the aviation world owes to the Comet is that it clearly demonstrated the need for fail-safe systems and structures in aircraft design, as well as robust fatigue testing before certification. This certainly saved many more lives in the decades that followed and allows the Comet to take its place in the true classics of aviation. Now, we will make a t-shirt design, like this one, for each of the classics that we will feature on the channel. So if you want to show which your favorite is and support our work, then you can go in and buy your own right now. There are links directly below this video and in the video description as well. Check out this video next or maybe this playlist and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.